So uh, Andreas, Veronica, Martin, thank you for joining us. Um, uh, I want, to, want us to start, uh, if each of you could uh, spend two, three minutes just talking about kind of your background uh, and, and the role that, that this technology has played in the work that you do. Why don't we start with Veronica? Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Um, I'm really honored to be here. Um, so at BitLumens, uh, we are actually building a smart meter that it's connected to Hyperledger blockchain. And we are doing this for two different reasons. One of them is to provide a carbon certificate. So we are running the calculation on the carbon mitigation piece on chain, later on tokenizing it through a layer two Ethereum uh, type of XDAI, XDAI uh, type of uh, blockchain. And then later on, the idea would be to really uh, enter into the marketplace, simply because we believe that the carbon marketplace will grow uh, over time. Uh, we just heard that Nasdaq, for instance, um, had uh, purchased a very important entity from Finland to do uh, carbon trading. Um, and then we bring this type of uh, smart meter into rural communities, mainly in communities that are connected uh, to mini grids, uh, micro grids or renewable power plants. Okay, and the idea would also be to provide the end user, the person consuming electricity with um, a sort of uh, credit score. Okay, a scoring system that it's also running on, on Hyperledger uh, blockchain. So uh, we have been active since the past two years. Um, the smart meter is right now ready. So we will be able to start piloting in India, Mexico, and Bolivia. So I will leave it there. Thank you. That's, that's fantastic. That's really, that's really cool to hear about. Andrea, so how does this line up with your work at Siemens? I, 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 I couldn't think of like two more different companies at, at, at the ends of the, the commercial spectrum, perhaps. Uh, um, but I, I have a sense that you, you and Veronica probably share a lot of similar uh, views on how, how much of this will roll out. But what are you doing yeah, no, at Siemens? That's, that's right. So thanks, Brian, and hi to all of you. Um, yeah, I'm in Siemens in charge of uh, cybersecurity technology. It's a global team that covers cybersecurity technologies really across the, the spectrum of the enterprise of Siemens, the production part of Siemens, the factories, uh, and the, the products and solutions that Siemens offers. Uh, before joining Siemens, I was actually with uh, IBM Research in, in, in Zurich uh, for quite a long time, 19 years, uh, very much involved in Hyperledger fabric development. Uh, but what brings me here now to Hyperledger Global Forum are actually very concrete industrial problems. Uh, and it's three, three areas. The first one is sort of around machine identities, um, where we see that the traditional, more centralized way of uh, giving out identities to devices uh, maybe needs to be rethought or uh, extended with more decentralized forms. And the second one is uh, that we feel the trust that we very often talk uh, around ecosystems today, we, we, we know business is more and more done in ecosystems. It has to reach into the physical world. And this touches already on the sustainability problem when we talk about uh, carbon footprints, for instance, it has to do with the physical production processes in a factory, for instance. How do you really trust uh, a transaction that eventually makes it into a little piece of the uh, aggregated uh, product carbon footprint. Uh, and um, uh, the third um, area is really the um, trustworthiness in sustainability, uh, where we um, as Siemens, uh, uh, as a company, feel of course much more responsibility coming, um, but also we see the carbon pricing coming. So that's um, an area where we have to be uh, um, at the forefront um, to address these topics. And it should not be uh, as a kind of PR, uh, in a PR way to, to look uh, environmentally friendly, but uh, it has to be uh, an approach that really is, uh, is based on a foundation where trustworthiness means more than just uh, you know, a word on a, uh, on a web page or a word from, from some executives. It, it has to be based on technology. Uh, and that um, yeah, leads to blockchain, leads to um, maybe um, more the verifiable credential part of, of blockchain. I believe there is a lot of potential uh, in order to trace sustainability, trace uh, carbon footprints, trace also any kind of ESG values um, that are 
from the problem statement very similar to trace as, as carbon footprints. Um, yeah, that's my, my quick intro. That's great. No, it's a it's it's a very uh, uh, complementary angle to to, to Veronica's. Um, Martin, what, why don't you tell us about the work that that you've done at Yale and and that you are are planning to do with the Open Earth Foundation? Great. First, a pleasure to join you all, and, and in many ways, uh, as uh, nonprofits, uh, both at Yale and at the foundation, our role is also to help integrate all the different parts, the big companies, the small ones, the governments as well, and help bring in a lot of these multi stakeholders. But the heart of what, what I've been focusing on is, is leveraging systems thinking to tackle planetary scale solutions because uh, the, the magnitude of the challenge requires that whatever system we design has to be also designed for exponential scale. So we, we lie at the intersection of emerging digital technology with uh, blockchain uh, and DLTs as, as one of our uh, tools of choice, um, but also the power of open source in many ways leveraging the hyperledger tools and other type of tools of the sector, but to concrete applications in the climate space. So to give an example, two things that we're operating at the moment, on one side, um, in the area of climate action finance with interoperability of different platforms in the process of securitizing, let's say solar financing to be able to streamline that process. On the other side, uh, cli open climate, which is probably our most ambitious project, which is to design and, and um, and deploy an integrated climate accounting system for the Paris Agreement. And that starts for the, by having consensus in the state of a carbon budget, but also on how we create uh, verifiable climate credentials for individuals, companies, subnational governments, and nations, so that their carbon footprints and inventories can scale up to uh, the, the international stage of the Paris Agreement. Much to be said there, but uh, well, my last comment in the intro is, Thankfully, I'm not the chair of the Hyperledger Climate Action SIG anymore. Uh, for after finishing the first year, passed along to amazing new co-chairs. And I, that really shows when communities start taking off. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thanks, Martin, for that correction. Well, um, why don't we just dive into the, the the heart of this for a lot of people who are are kind of on the outside a bit of, of blockchain and climate, which is people hear a lot about um, kind of the neg negative uh, 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 environmental impact of the use of blockchain technology. They they and, and I know those of us on the inside know the distinction between the different technologies, consensus mechanisms, that kind of thing. But but how important is it that we we actually uh, you know get a, a really clear sense of visibility into the, 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 the ESG burdens that both uh, are, are, are embedded inside the financial infrastructure that we're trying to build here uh, and into the financial assets. I mean, I, um, and, and, and through that, I mean, how do we actually counter some of these concerns? If we're building new financial infrastructure for energy, uh, uh, you know, financing and accounting and that sort of thing, how do we respond to the, how do we respond to those concerns um, uh, that, that not only the public has, but, but regulators have as well? Who wants to take that first? I'm, I'm actually going to start, if, if you don't mind, just because you, you brought in the, the, the dialogue that's been very intense this year around the intensity of blockchains, which is obviously in some sense a misnomer. The heart of it is in, in the proof of work uh, consensus protocol. And it's the first time I actually think about it. It's actually quite ironic that a technology around traceability and around accounting actually has a really hard time pinpointing exactly it's, uh, where its emissions are coming from to be able to proper uh, sort of address that from 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 Bitcoin standpoint, but but if we if we if we take that as as the whole, it, we have there a good example because miners are consuming electricity. We need to be able to have more visibility of where that's happening. Uh, what's the intensity of the grids that they have, which is not as visible as what we'd like to do. Those are also companies that represents the, the footprint of that company. So if you're an investor on a, let's say a proof of work mining company, you're probably gonna want to know that. And if you would have more traceability on that process, that would trickle into data of the ESG. Uh, but then it also, uh, if, if all of that's worked together properly, it would go all the way to the product level, which is the Bitcoin that, that a person would hold. Uh, so if, if we would actually use the technology for, for one of its uh, uh, great uh, uses, we would be able to have a lot more clear transparency at the product and the company level. So taking that into the corporate world, you, you'd be able to easily translate into how relevant that is for ESG, but pass it along to someone else also to chime in. Anyone else want to chime in? 
Yeah, I, I will also say something. I think it's important to understand that the new technologies that had emerged over the past years are enabling new type of use cases uh, to tackle climate change and to provide climate disclosures. Um, but these applications, you know, it, independently on where your data centers are and what type of protocols you are using, are also, um, we need better also collaboration between public and private entities, uh, in particular for three points, right, that are very important for climate change. One of them are investment flows, because we need trillions of dollars of investments to really be able to comply with the Paris Agreement, right? Uh, the second one is pricing risks. How can uh, regulators uh, price the risk uh, surrounding climate change? And the third one is accessing data. And when I heard, you know, a lot of financial regulators talking on how can we access uh, data, uh, there is not enough data to be able to align uh, their financial flows with the allocation to SDGs. It's really to me interesting because over the past year, we have seen an explosion of data, 5,000% growth, uh, that it's coming mainly from satellite imagery um, and IoT. And if you combine IoT with things like blockchain, mainly for climate disclosures, and be able to access finance, right? Let's assume a lot of SMEs get together in a conglomerate and they are able to issue a bond on chain. You're reducing the cost of issuance and that has a huge impact on, on, on the community. It has a huge social impact as well if you work, for instance, in rural communities or in the areas that are needed most. Um, and, and I think traceability of data, transparency and verification will be key to really be able to access the marketplace, in particular, the, the carbon marketplace. Yeah, trace, traceability of, of data sounds really important there, but, but I think also I want to key on that verification kind of phase. How do we trust this data? I was actually reading an article about um, deep fakes now uh, emerging in satellite data. Uh, you can use um, you know, AI to ma manufacture satellite data to look like however you'd want it to look like. So Andreas, how does the work that you're doing um, uh, tie into this? Because uh, I, I, I think that question of how do we trust the data that we're collecting and, and storing into the ledger? You know, it's not, we know that it's not truthful just because it's written to a blockchain, right? Like it, how, do we, how do we get a sense to tr uh, around trusting this data that, that is coming from all these different sources? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the domain that uh, we operate, uh, it's almost always um, a physical domain. It's a train system, it's an energy system, uh, it's a factory, it's a, it's a city with the traffic lights. Um, and uh, I think in the past, um, when you look at supply chain use cases, um, it was thought that it would be enough to just connect the ERP systems of the different companies in the supply chain to a blockchain. And, and uh, because they should reflect basically the truth within the company, uh, and then everything would be fine. But it turned out that um, in, in many domains, this is surely not enough. To ha you have to extend the trust into the physical domain uh, to make this uh, really um, uh, sensible, usable, the data that is in the blockchain. You can have it perfectly hashed and, and chained up, uh, but if the, the input is, is just an oracle that comes from an ERP system, it, it's not enough. So that's the reason why we uh, quite early um, try to port uh, the um, sort of uh, native uh, uh, client um, parts of the, the different stacks onto some, some things like uh, the programmable logic devices. So in, in factories, when you look at machines that uh, control things, you always have these gray boxes uh, with the blinking LED lights. So they, they look very old fashioned, but inside is actually a pretty cool technology. Uh, it's, a, it's a vertical, uh, business model very similar to, to the iPhone actually where, where everything is, is like very tightly integrated down to the, the silicon level. Um, and here we um, attempt to bring in uh, or we, we manage to, to have some of the, uh, the, the agents so the, the, the client uh, parts that you have in fabric for instance ported on. Um, and with this you know that if a valve opens the transactions actually signed at that point, and you can you can send it off or the energy consumption. So if you talk about um, uh, sustainability, CO two emissions, uh, we have this differentiation of the different scopes. Um, so the, the direct emissions uh, scope one, the energy uh, scope two, and then the supply chain. That's another topic, of course. But if we look just scope one, scope two within 
uh, a factory context, one trust domain, uh, you uh, really have to track all these kind of events that are somehow triggered by, the, by these programmable logic controllers. Uh, and bringing the trust into with, with the respective keys that make sense in the the the, the back end uh, of the the blockchain network. So it should not be two uh, identity systems. It has to be uh, the same kind of trust domain in order to make it uh, sensible. So that that that's a that's a, a a big area for us to work on. Yeah, um, uh, and I have a follow up question to that. But first, let me just mention to the audience, if any of you have questions you'd like me to ask, feel free to ask them inside Hopin. Uh, and uh, we'll pull them over. I'll try to pick one. Um, uh, apologies if I don't get to your question, but feel free to ask and I'll, 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 I'll try to try to bring it in. Um, Following up on that, and that's that's really to, to anybody here. Uh, it feels like part of the the you know getting to the question of what is truth, what is what is trustworthy, what's verifiable, um, is also partly a question of uh, uh, which data do we decide to put on ledger, and which data kind of sits off ledger, right? And which is somewhat related uh, to this question of when do we consider using private ledgers and public le public ledgers too? Um, does anyone want to kind of touch on kind of the, the, the architecture of, you know, at one extreme, things are very public uh, and that means data is automatically shared, but that's hard to convince companies to completely be public with all their data versus, uh, 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 but that way you can be transactional about it too, versus how do you just, you know, have a system for verifying timestamps of claims being made and that sort of thing, right? Like um, uh, anyone want to talk about that or how they've approached that and the work that they've done. Yeah, I, I could give it a first shot maybe. So I think the general rule for us is to store as little as possible onto uh, a public blockchain. Even uh, in, a, in a permission context, we would try to avoid to put any kind of real data uh, onto the chain. Very often, you don't need to. And even if it's encrypted, uh, there's risk that eventually it can be, uh, um, you know, thinking about post-quantum crypto and so on. Uh, it, it's not completely secure uh, in, in a couple of years. Um, so we try to avoid, but rather have uh, like a reference um, that points to something that sits off chain or have some form of hashing. Also for um, reasons that in some cases you want to actually delete a value um, that, that has to do with privacy, confidentiality, where things have to um, eventually um, yeah, move out of, of, of your, your system. If it's there forever chained, you cannot. Uh, in the other case, you, you can. Uh, so that's our general rule. Sometimes you cannot avoid it, but um, I think we try to avoid. And then also going verifiable credentials. Sometimes you, you, you want to have a peer-to-peer -peer exchange. You don't need this uh, Central, well, central. Right. It's of course not central, but it's the 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 ledger that is the the truth for everybody. Uh, so right. it's okay to use verifiable credentials, have underlying the de decentralized infrastructure for sharing the 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 uh, the, the schema, the revocation list, and, and basically the indie indie kind of approach. Yeah. Any, any, um, I okay. I want to continue a little bit on on what we have done in that particular respect. We we have also chosen a, a private type of ledger uh, simply because we also have um, a type of software as a service where we have different permissions in the system, right? And so if we have data coming every five minutes from thousands of devices, let's call them the smart meters, each of them has a particular ID that we are putting on, on the chain, right? So it's the UDID. Uh, we also identify the houses where we are currently working on chain. But uh, again, the, we only use two different APIs to put that on chain. One is for the uh, carbon mitigation piece and the other one is for the credit scoring uh, part. Uh, so then later on we can share the scores or the result, the, the outcome with whoever needs it. But it's, I think it's a pretty flexible uh, way of, of working around privacy issues and, and, and also verification issues depending on the commands you give to the to the smart meter, right? So I, I understand coming to your uh, later question, I understand what has been tampered in the system and how we can actually verify data because of the commands we have given previously. Right. And if right. I, I can chime in, mm -hmm. you know, a couple of things also there. Uh, Andreas was talking about sort of sources of truth and focusing a lot on, on like physical agents but a, a big part of the killer application of DIDs and verifiable credentials is 
also seen in the interface between government and companies. So for example, British Columbia has done a great job at, at, at practicing a lot of this stuff. And in the process of establishing these trust networks, um, a verifier for uh, data that's, that has a level of privacy and can, can access data derivatives, so not the raw data, but, but trust the, how the data has been calculated, that also can lead to publishing certain information about that, that data that needs to be public into, for example, uh, a more public ledger. But, it, but it's a, a lot of that, that trust and chain of, of, of information um, that becomes very important and available with some of these tools. But it almost sounds like, um, uh, if I'm, I'm hearing folks, if you were to th roughly split the, um, the the use cases between digital identity uh, and and I mean not just you know companies and individuals, but also the identity of the the sensors and 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 that kind of thing, um, and uh, you know transactions in terms of trading of carbon credits and and other types of almost like tokenization kinds of use cases but things that are kind of mechanically about traceability if i were to split these two it almost sounds like the first one is going to be more important in the fight against climate change uh, uh for for a while at least in in the in the work that everyone's doing here than the latter is that is that a fair observation or or am i uh, do, do you think it'll be more even-handed um, I think it's important to be able to have a balanced architecture for, for both. Um, and, and this is kind of the, the hard thing about how to design a properly trusted integrated accounting system um, is to how do we determine how we all speak about climate in the same way? How do we trust a lot of that data? Because at the end of the day, we're going to have a, a pressure crunch between the information that's in the atmosphere that's, that's, that's uh, derived from our, our sensors and our integrative assessment models, but also what the world's reporting so that we constantly know how much of a laggard we are as individuals, companies, uh, uh, subnational governments and national governments, and what are the changes that we need to do? And what we said we were going to do, which is also very important to have a level of immutability. So we can go back and say, that's what you said back then. So this is where you're at now. Um, that, that also allows levels of automation. So I think it's, it's the integrated sort of design that becomes very important, particularly on climate. Okay. Uh, I, I, I want Veronica, to say something yep. really quickly about that. I think uh, Martin just touched on a very, very important topic, at least for me personally, because when I hear regulators, you know, talk about all the goals and at least in Europe, the taxonomy and the reporting that companies would have to do to comply with the Paris Agreement goals or the net zero 2050, it's insane. And then if you can simply take the information coming from satellite imagery and you know what is the carbon, the CO2 that it's being released and the carbon footprint, you know, it's actually very, very simple. So how we can provide this data investor ready. And I think that will be a really interesting use case. And I hope to see more of those use cases in the future. Okay, Andres, any closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think it's a bit around speed as well that we, so in our context, it's we want to move very fast uh, because we feel carbon pricing is coming. We have to be prepared. And if we move into a system that is in a regulatory gray area or let's say in a difficult area as uh, just uh, Veronica, Veronica just mentioned, uh, we cannot move as fast. Um, so this is why we focus on what we can actually do with, with respect to producing a sneaker, a mobile phone, a car, and how to correctly measure it and also give um, possibilities to do different sourcing, uh, that you do simulations and you, you, you change the design of your product or your purchasing decisions based on this kind of data at hand. So that's, that's our angle. But I, I understand there's another part. If both comes together, there's, there's even more boost. Yeah. Well, there's lots of important work to do. We actually have a Hyperledger lab, uh, thanks to the Climate Action Accounting SIG, focused on uh, uh, bits and pieces of this. Uh, lots more that, that we could do here. Uh, uh, Martin, Veronica, Andreas, thank you for helping give the audience a taste of this. All three of them are doing talks and panels uh, throughout the rest of the event. So please come and, and, and dive into that if you, if you are interested in this topic. And with that, I'll close the panel. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.